Hi, I'm Jeff Lichtman, and I'd like to talk about uh, tracing out wiring diagrams in the brain. In previous uh, discussions, uh, I've talked about the wiring diagram in muscle, where things are pretty straightforward. Still, it's not trivial to do these wiring diagrams. But um, except for me and a small number of people, I think most, most people are interested in the brain more than they are in muscle. I, I, I'm one of those people who would prefer to study muscle uh, to the brain. Uh, but clearly we would like uh, eventually to be able to do wiring diagrams in the brain and do connectomics in the brain. It's a challenge because the tools that we had previously developed, these tools that are called Brainbow, where each nerve cell is labeled a different color, although they provide uh, very nice looking pictures of the brain, this is cerebral cortex for example, um, it is hard to deal with the tracing of wires. If we zoom up on a small part of this piece of brain, this is sort of a technicolor Golgi. That is, the cells are many different colors. Um, but what really matters is not the color of the cells, it's the felt work, this fine stuff in between the cells, whether we can trace out those wires to see how one cell is connected to another. And with at least the original generation brain bows, when we tried to use the best optical imaging techniques we could at the highest resolution possible, that's Nyquist oversampling the data and using the highest numerical aperture lenses for the aficionados, uh, if you view an area like that at high resolution, it just, not surprisingly perhaps, it's just way too many wires there. Uh, it's very hard to sort them out. And one of the reasons is that within a single optical section, the thinnest you can focus, there are often multiple wires superimposed on top of each other. And you have a hard time, especially if the colors are hard to discriminate, and there's only so many colors you get out of Brainbow, uh, to know whether axons are crossing or just getting near each other and veering off. So the cell bodies are easy to see, but the wires are a little problematic. If you want to look at a subset of cells in the central nervous system, uh, Brainbow looks like a good technique. And, and one of the things Darwin K uh, has done is develop um, a kind of virus uh, that allows us to infect brains with a Brainbow set of viruses, actually. Uh, that allow one to see very clearly subsets of cells. These are AAV viruses, and if one has CRE only in a subset of cells in the brain for recombination only to occur in that subset of cells, those cells will undergo color transformations and recombination. The other cells will remain dark. I'll just show you one example of this, uh, which is a piece of cortex in which um, the virus uh, was used to infect cells that also have parvalbumin-driven CRE. And PV, parvalbumin, is found in inhibitory neurons. And what you're seeing in this nest of axons are axons that surround the cell bodies, these dark objects uh, like that, uh, that are pyramidal neurons. Uh, and those pyramidal neurons are encrusted with inhibitory axons. And we think uh, techniques like this will allow us to trace out, for example, inhibitory networks. You can see how much less dense this image is than the previous one. But what if uh, we really want to see all the connections? And for many of the questions I am interested in personally, I really need to see all the connections. And that requires uh, going to techniques that allow us to cut brains thin enough that every single section uh, is disambiguous uh, uh, from the section in front and the section in back. When you use a confocal microscope, uh, there's not much you can do below about three quarters of a micron. Things that are in 750 nanometers of each other tend to be in the same focal plane, and it becomes very hard to disambiguate one thing from another. But if you could cut brains thinner than that, and I'm thinking about cutting brains not at 750 nanometers, but 30 nanometers, then every wire is in its own section, basically, and that makes the reconstruction much better. Um, so this is a tool that was built by Ken Hayworth with the help of Richard Chilek uh, that replaces the human EM technician, uh, the expert who knows how to take sections off of a microtome. This is the microtome here. This tool is an automatic collector of sections. 
And unlike a human being who uses an eyelash to push a section onto a thin film, this is a tape collecting device where the sections are collected on an actually quite sturdy, thick piece of plastic film. It's an automated collection approach, so we can collect up to 10,000 or so sections a day now. And because it's done automatically and the machine never stops, we lose very few sections. We don't destroy sections. They're sturdy. And once it's uh, made, these sections last a long time. A diagram of this device is shown here. It kind of looks like a movie projector, but it's really a movie projector in reverse in the sense we're generating a film. These are the individual sections that are coming off of a piece of brain. And let me just zoom up on the guts of this, the important part, which is the collection part right up there. So here is a block of brain where the brain has been embedded in a very hard resin. And then a microtome is moving that piece of plasticized brain up and down against a diamond knife. And the diamond knife peels off a section that's about 30 nanometers thick or thinner, thinner than 30 nanometers often, which floats on water and then is picked up by this conveyor belt. And one section after another move back up uh, on this conveyor belt. And each section is 30 nanometers in front of the section that came after it and 30 nanometers on the other side of the next section. Once you have all the sections, you basically have the brain on tape. And now this is a linearized version of the brain. And then we cut the tape up into strips and put the strips on a flat silicon wafer. You can see the sections on the wafer. And then image it in the electron microscope. Now, to generate a whole brain or a large piece of brain, one has to make a whole library of sections like this. And this is the idea here. One makes a library by taking the strips, uh, putting them on a silicon wafer. This idea of a library was one of Ken Hayworth's ideas when he built this in the first place. Um, and that one wafer after another, you just keep going until you have the entire brain on wafers. And uh, now uh, we have a data set of 55 such wafers. They're about the size of CDs, uh, which is a, a substantial chunk uh, in thalamus, for example. If we look at one of these uh, wafers uh, in the electron microscope, uh, that's what it looks like. Each of the sections, you can see one after another. Um, we use little grids, the old-fashioned grids that were used to pick up sections before, now as fiduciary marks to allow us to align the wafer uh, in the electron microscope. And if we zoom in on one of these sections and look at that in the electron microscope, uh, that's what a section might look like. So what you see is a bunch of blood vessels. These big light objects are blood vessels. There's one up there. And there are some smaller ones here. And then in between these gray circles, those are neurons. And these dark streaks are clusters of myelinated axons that are ensheathed in a lot of myelin. This is stained with a heavy metal of osmium that coats all the membranes dark. And myelin has a lot of membrane in it, so you see a lot of darkness. And then again, between the cells, all you have is felt work. And I'll show you what's in there in a moment. To see that felt work, we image this, and this is about a millimeter by a millimeter image, uh, at high resolution. So a light microscope, you have about the best resolution, if you don't use super resolution techniques, is about 250 or so nanometers, a quarter of a micron. We're imaging this uh, yellow box at four nanometer lateral resolution, and this section is 30 nanometers thick. So what does that section look like at 4 nanometers resolution? So here is that section at 4 nanometers resolution. It doesn't look very impressive. It looks sort of like what I showed you before. But this is clearly not the full size image. This is the whole data set. But in fact, at 4 nanometers resolution, it's 100,000 pixels from left to right and 100,000 pixels from top to bottom. This screen is about 1,000 pixels wide, roughly, roughly in that range. So this image is actually 100 times larger than the picture you're looking at and 100 times 
taller and wider. In fact, to see the whole picture, you'd have to back up so far it would look like this again. So I can't show you the entire data set at once. This image is a 10 billion pixel image, a 10 gigapixel image. Some of you may have cameras that are 10 megapixel. This is an image that's a thousand times bigger. So you have to take a thousand pictures for each of these. And that is because it's a montage of 16 images. That's what these streaks that you see are. It's a four by four array of 25,000 by 25,000 pixel images all knitted together to make this 100,000 by 100,000 image. That's one image and then we do that 10,300 times. So huge data set and it's about 100 terabytes uh, and we do about a terabyte per day uh, as we take these images with our present tools. This is a single image. It gives you an impression of how much data there is in one image. I'd like to show you all the images, all 10,300 of them at once. I've got to make them very small to see them, but there's a point I'd like to show uh, by doing that. And this is the 10,300 sections. This is more than 100 terabytes of data. And each of these little boxes is one 10 gigabyte, gigapixel image. And one of the things you can see is that the quality of the machines we're using require that they work minute after minute, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and never uh, fail. And in fact, when you're taking that much data, occasionally they do. Notice, for example, this image here and uh, that image there and maybe that image there where there's no image uh, and this is because occasionally the machine would shut down for inexplicable reasons. When we talked to the company uh, that made this microscope they said what do you expect you know this is crazy amount of data we never tested a machine uh, for such long periods. Notice here also that the images got progressively darker and in another place down here they got progressively lighter over time. Machines are not yet designed, uh, optimized for this kind of continuous imaging. Uh, eventually these problems will be worked out. So what do you get when you take all these images and stack them up? You generate a 100 terabyte data set, in this case of Thalmus. Uh, it's a lot of data and in some ways very impressive. In another way not so impressive, uh, if you actually look at the size of that data set, it's about the size of a grain of salt. You could take this data with a grain of salt, if you will, uh, but it took us a long time. Josh Morgan did all the work of taking this image data, and that image data is a, really a tremendous repository now because at that resolution that we've taken the data, we can see every synaptic vesicle in every synapse in something that you might think is small, but for us that's a pretty large amount of data. The next thing I'd like to show you is uh, what does the data actually look like? I'm going to show you not a piece of thalamus, but a piece of cortex. By zooming in, uh, the way you might in Google Maps, start from a long distance and zoom in to finally see uh, the structural details. And this is Bobby Kasturi, who uh, is the person who optimized our use of scanning electron microscopes for this. I asked him to hold his hand really still as we zoomed in on one of these 30 nanometer sections of cerebral cortex. So this is the cortex up here and the hippocampus is down below. And at some point, uh, he's got to enter the electron microscope. He obviously doesn't do that himself, but uh, he puts the section in there. These are blood vessels, and these are the nerve cells. And these white streaks that you're seeing running diagonally, those are the apical dendrites. These black uh, circled objects are the myelinated axons, and these dark uh, objects inside cells are mitochondria. And here's a synapse on a dendritic spine, a vesicle-filled profile of an axon making a synapse on a spine with a spine apparatus that's attached to this dendrite over here. So that's one section, but of course the idea here is to get a wiring diagram. We're going to have to do that section after section. So here is at low resolution for us, 30 nanometers per pixel, uh, a series of several thousand sections that, that we're going through. And you see cell bodies uh, being cut, uh, like this big object here, and that's the nucleus of the cell body, and all this stuff moving around. And, Obviously, this is from plastic. Nothing is actually moving. This is not a time-lapse image. It's a space-lapse image. We're going from one section to the next, and as the wires pass through the sections, they appear to be moving from one place to another. And you can see at this low resolution lots of big objects, like these white objects that are moving around that are the big dendrites and these myelinated axons. And in between, there's other stuff. You don't see it very well. The other thing you might notice is this image looks like it's 
coming from 1903. Uh, it's all grainy, and that's because the tape underneath is giving a little bit of noise. This, by the way, is a blood vessel down here. That's the endothelial cell, and that's the entrance where the blood cells are. If we zoom up at higher resolution and look at the same data, uh, you see that between these large objects moving around are lots of little wires also moving around. The brain is just filled with wires. This is a big cell body of a neuron up here, pyramidal cell, and all these little wires are moving from one place to another, filled with vesicles. Those vesicles are where the synapses are. If you look carefully, you'll see that there are synaptic vesicle-filled profiles almost everywhere in the gray matter. And if you look carefully also, you feel like you can follow many of these objects from one section to the next. Uh, in fact, if you gave a, a five-year-old a coloring book with a thousand or ten thousand pages of black and white like this, and gave them a crayon and asked them to color the same object in, the same color from section after section, you could get the wiring diagram of data like this. Uh, Daniel Berger uh, built such a coloring book uh, for digital use, um, and I'll show you that in the following slide. So this is a digital coloring book uh, where uh, anyone who wants can go in and color in an object and color it in the same color section after section after section. And you can see that it's easy to follow these uh, objects from one section to another, especially when you color them all in. The gray objects here were also colored in, but we kept them gray because they're the glial cells, they're not neurons. And from this data, you can then take uh, just generate the three-dimensional version of it. This is the same data exactly. These are all those dendrites with their spines. And then packed in between them are lots of little axons that are making connections with them. And what's left out are the glial cells. Those are the little cavities you see. And there's not that much glial stuff in there relative to neuropil, as it's called. So that looks impressive, but it's really uh, useless. It's useless in large part because every side of this box is orphaned. We don't know where it came from. We're looking at a small region of brain. But how small is what's really uh, painful to look at here. So there is the region that was reconstructed in this section. And that section sits here in this piece of a section. And this piece of a section sits there in this whole section of cortex. So that little green blinking dot, if you can see it, which is the smallest dot I can make on this screen, is bigger than what we actually ended up in, in doing. And to make matters uh, even worse, let me give you a sense of what a single voxel of an fMRI image is. That's a cubic millimeter. By this uh, standard, a cubic millimeter is that big. So what we've actually ended up doing is uh, a very small amount of brain and clearly not sufficient. Even taking the images, much less coloring them in, just taking the images take time. If we wanted, let's say, to do a cubic millimeter, at the rate we were going when we began doing this work over three years ago, we were doing around a half a million pixels per second in our imaging, and that would require us to go about 2.24 centuries just to generate the data for a cubic millimeter, and that would be about 2,000 terabytes. And uh, no graduate student uh, I met was interested in this project uh, for no, for obvious reasons, because uh, they knew I would be dead by the time they finished, as well as them. So uh, this was not possible to, to work at those speeds. So since then, we've been optimizing the imaging techniques to go faster and faster. At the moment, uh, we go about 20 million pixels per second, so 40 times faster and we can do about a terabyte a day, and we can do a cubic millimeter of data in 5.6 years. Uh, we just have a new machine uh, delivered that goes about 40 million pixels per second, uh, and so eventually we hope to be doing a cubic millimeter in 2.8 years. That's still too long to do, I think, useful comparative biology uh, of different brains that maybe have different experiences or different diseases. Uh, but soon we hope to be going much faster, another 60-fold faster or so, going over a billion pixels per second, uh, and thinking about doing cubic millimeters in less than a month, maybe even a few weeks. And the way we're going to go that fast is by, instead of using scanning electron microscopes that have a single beam, using scanning electron microscopes that each have many beams in them. 
Uh, and in collaboration with uh, Zeiss, a company that is building this in Germany, uh, they have been building a 61-beam scanning electron microscope, which gives us 61-fold more beams scanning at any one time. It's like having 61 microscopes all in one. The original prototype is a hefty-looking device, especially when you compare it to the size of a normal-sized human being. It's a massive and impressive piece of technology, uh, and German engineering really comes to the fore in devices like this. So we hope uh, eventually to be going fast enough uh, to do serious biology with connectomes. Of course, that just gives you the images. How about tracing it? You know, the tracing is a slow process. The area we traced before is just this minuscule part of this image. What you'd like is to have everything colored in, and here is everything colored in, but not colored in by a human being, but colored in by a machine, by computers. This is work uh, that we're doing in collaboration with an engineering lab uh, at Harvard, Hans Peter Pfister's lab. And that kind of data uh, generates uh, wiring diagrams much, much faster than humans can generate them. So this is entirely automated. And the, the algorithm is getting better and better and better. If you look carefully at this movie, you might find an object that changes color. If it does, the algorithm failed us. It means it, it got confused. Uh, most recently, uh, there are parts of the brain where you really have to look hard to find any errors at all. But we think this is the future for this kind of um, analysis to do this without humans doing a lot of tracing. So what do we do with data like this? I'm just going to end with a couple of movies to give you a sense of what we're doing. So we sparsely reconstruct a bunch of neurons in a cortical column in the cerebral cortex. And then we decided for one of those neurons, we would learn everything we possibly could about 1,000 cubic microns around one apical dendrite of one pyramidal cell. So this little cylinder is everything inside one little region of the dendrite of one cell, just around it. And in a sense, because it's all surrounding that dendrite, every axon in there has a potential to innervate that particular dendrite. But what else is in there? It turns out there's a lot of stuff in that little region. There's about 675 synapses, 530 different axons, 90 different dendrites. And when we look at the connectivity, it, looks ran it doesn't look random at all. It looks in an interesting way that some axons prefer to make multiple synapses on some dendrites, and other axons prefer to make multiple synapses on other dendrites. You can uh, see that by tracing out a single axon, but I want to give you a sense of what it means to have 675 synapses in one little area like this by showing you all the synaptic vesicles of all the synapses in that area. You just have this cloud of synapses around this dendrite, and many of those synapses are not on this dendrite. This dendrite only has 80 excitatory synapses on it, but there are about 600 synapses in that region. If we look at a single axon at a time, you see that many of these axons seem to have some special affinity for this dendrite, and other axons have a special affinity for other dendrites, even though they're all excitatory axons. And then because, as I said, we can see individual synaptic vesicles, we can go in and look at the synaptic vesicles of every synapse of every axon innervating this cell. And I'll just end by showing you some pictures like that, uh, not so much to make a big point of what we have learned, but how much we don't understand. The brain is vastly complicated. This is not an artist's rendering of the brain. These little dot, yellow dots, each of them is a synaptic vesicle inside a synapse. When you look at the brain at this high level of resolution, and here's one last view of this, I think you get the impression that the brain is extraordinarily complicated. Um, but maybe at this level, uh, one will learn uh, sort of the way information is instantiated in brain structure. One may learn what diseases like schizophrenia actually look like as a physical disease of the brain. And ultimately, I think you get a really good sense of humility because at least my brain, what I do with my brain, the thoughts that come out of my brain are far less impressive, uh, if you will, than the complexity of the machine that allows me to do that thinking. And I think I'll end uh, with that thought and just uh, recognize the many, many people who did this work. I've been a cheerleader for a lot of this work, but I want to point out 
uh, that this kind of science cannot, I don't think, be done in a single laboratory. One needs computer scientists, uh, one needs uh, people who are very good with molecular biology, and one needs engineers, and uh, I'm grateful to a wide range of colleagues for much of the work I've talked about. Thank you.